Hey, it's Sarah Burke here from the Women in Media podcast. And before we get started on a new episode, could I get you to hit like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell, whichever app you do your podcast listening in. Make sure you're all set up so you know when there's a new episode and you can help spread the word. Oh, and if you're so inclined, could I ask you to leave a review if the app that you're using does that? You're the best. All right, let's get to the show. I'm Sarah Burke, and this is the Women in Media podcast and my first episode of 2023. I'm sort of laughing at how I got connected to this award-winning journalist, weather anchor and host out of Victoria. Tess Van Stratton is here. Welcome to the podcast. Nice to meet you. It's the woman behind the viral sleeve story. (laughs) I know. I did not have going viral on my 2023 bingo card at all, and I never (laughs) thought I would become famous over a dress, but... Thank you so much for having me to talk about what is really a silly story, but also a major issue that women in the public eye face, not just broadcasters, but female politicians as well, and any women who take on a public role. Yeah, and you know what? Anytime I'm talking to someone who does on-screen work, this topic comes up, right? No matter what. It's it's a consistent topic, unfortunately. So first off, um, I actually want to read the comment, just in case right. you know somebody listening doesn't know this story. You walk into the Czech News Studio on New Year's Eve and you're wearing like a dress. It has some stripes and it has no sleeves. It's a business casual dress, right? Is that how you would describe it? Absolutely. Like it's tailored. It's it's no cleavage. It's just I'm just sleeveless in one of those tailored dresses. Yeah. And you do a 5 p.m. weather forecast. And what ends up happening is somebody um, comments on your outfit saying, and I quote, I find it inappropriate for Tess to still wear sleeveless tops in the winter. In my opinion, she should be wearing a suit jacket and look more professional. It's almost upsetting to see what she is wearing. In that moment, what were you thinking? Well, the first I was like, oh, I thought I looked nice. Because, you know, when you're on camera, especially during weather and you have to turn sideways and something could look great, but on camera, it doesn't look great. So when I was actually doing weather that day, I was like, oh, this looks really nice. I'm going to have to wear this dress again. It looks good. So that was my first thought. (laughs) And then my second thought was, wait, what is almost upsetting me? And surely if you're watching the news and seeing all the horrible things happening in the world, that's stuff that's worth getting upset about, not whether my arms are showing And it was actually the second bare arms email I'd had. I had another one in the summer. It was hot. I was in a sleeveless shirt. And the lady, it was another lady who emailed in to say, I should cover up my arms. And how dare I show my arms on television? And I'm thinking, so I got this email on the first day of 2023. It's 2023. It's not 1923 or 1823. Come on. Yeah, come on. And Why are we still talking about this? I've been in broadcasting for more than 20 years. It's been like this since I've been in broadcasting, but it's worse now. It's actually getting worse. So in the past, we shrug off these comments, ignore them, don't reply, don't give it any fuel. That has sort of been the mantra. Ignore it, it'll go away. But yeah, no kidding. worse, Worse now than it ever was. And ignoring bad behavior doesn't make it go away. So that's why I tweeted, my feelings weren't hurt. And as emails go, this one's pretty benign. You should see some of the emails women in our newsroom and other newsrooms I've worked in get. I mean, some are awful, like hugely critical of how someone looks, Mm -hmm. hugely critical of their weight, telling them they should wear black all the time because it'll be more slimming because they look fat on TV, like just awful things or their hair is atrocious. And I can't imagine taking the time to send an email or call. People will phone the newsroom as well to to criticize how someone looks. You know, if you have a problem with our coverage or if we got something wrong in a story, or if you think my forecast wasn't very good, that's all fair game. But how we look is personally attacking us. And it's so disheartening that these emails and comments are almost always from other women. Yeah, that's the part that like really strikes me is how women can be worse with other women. It's not like a man in this case saying something and and us being like, you know nothing about what we go through and how we're feeling and how we want to dress on a day-to-day basis. This is another woman. Another woman, and it almost always is. 99% of the time, it's another woman. I think men, if they're watching, they might be like, oh, that's an ugly dress, but then they've moved on a second later. They're not going to actually tell you that. They don't feel the need to make you feel bad. They just, it doesn't matter to them what dress I'm wearing or what my hair looks like, right? It's irrelevant. They're watching for the weather or the news. But I think it's women who've been pushed down or 
feel insecure and somehow by lashing out at other women, not just women in the public, but they must do it with other women in their life as well. And we all know women like that who do that. But somehow by tearing someone else down, they think it's going to make them feel better. But it never makes you feel better to make someone else feel bad. So that I'm hoping that people will think twice before they say a nasty comment. You'd never go up to a stranger on the street and go, oh, that outfit's ugly. You look terrible. Or you need to lose some weight as if you would say that. So what makes it okay to say that to someone via email, which is almost always sent to the entire newsroom email? It's not like they go on the website, find my email and email me directly to criticize me. They send it to the whole newsroom so everybody will see it. And it's awful when these emails come in and we see them for our colleagues. It's just like, oh, so me. Why did you feel the need to criticize how I looked? You know, lots of people are saying, oh, she's jealous or she probably doesn't have arms like that. She feels bad about her arms. But I really think it comes from insecurity, that sort of lashing out. But I think a lot of women might do it without even thinking. And that's why hopefully this will make Mm -hmm. people think. And I don't know, I was raised, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all, right? If someone looks great or you think they're doing a wonderful job, great. Give someone a compliment. I compliment strangers with I think, you know, I love your coat. That looks so nice. Or that's a great color. And it brightens their day. I feel better. It brightens my day. I can't imagine saying something negative to somebody who has not asked for my feedback, right? (laughs) (laughs) I'll ask my kids and my partner, like, does this look okay? And I'm wanting feedback from them. But yeah, if someone hasn't asked you for feedback. eh. Circle back to the moment where you had the draft, you had the tweet as a draft. You mentioned in the article that you wrote on your, on the Czech website, um, that you weren't sure about posting it. So what gave you that reasoning that I need to post this, this story needs to be shared? Yeah. So I was like, Oh, gee, I'm going to screenshot that and a screenshot of the dress. And, and so I did the draft and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to wait. Should I send this? Because for most of my career, we've been told, just ignore it, it'll go away, just ignore it. No, but you know, it doesn't matter, let shrug it off. And I've had to develop a thicker skin. Don't engage. For years. Yeah, don't engage. Um, so I try to reply to all emails that come to me directly. In this case, it didn't come to me directly. So I didn't reply and I'm like, okay, I obviously didn't include her name or email address in the screenshot. I thought, no, I enough already. That's what came to me. It was the first day of 2023. And I just can't believe we're still talking about this. You know, when I started out my first job, I was doing my first anchor job doing the weather in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, we had a telethon on and someone called in and the main news anchor used to wear this, it was a fairly distinctive blazer. And she wore it frequently. And they emailed in to say, I'll give you $100 if she never wears that again, if she burns that blazer. Like, I think you're missing the point. We're doing a telethon here right? So you don't like the blazer. Oh, well, right? It's How is that upsetting your life that you don't like her blazer? Yeah, that word almost upsetting. Hilarious. Almost upsetting. Yeah. Oh, like, <laughs> can you imagine if I was actually upsetting? Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe I should try for something more revealing and then I can be actually upsetting. But I, I've played it safe my whole career because of that first experience with someone saying like, realizing people were aware of what you're wearing, they're critical of what you're wearing. So I, early on, it, the standard was a blazer. So I would wear blazers all the time, but that's evolved in the last 20 years. And now these types of tailored dresses are very common and they look great on TV. And it's nice not to have to wear a blazer all the time. And the other part of it that came out of this is, why do I have to dress like a man to look professional? Mic drop. Why? <laughs> I can look professional in a sweater set and blouse in. And then the response some people had online was, well, you don't see men wearing tank tops. Okay, well, first of all, I'm not wearing a tank top. I'm not going to wear spaghetti straps on air. That's not what I was wearing. But if a guy wants to wear a dress, a professional work dress, I'm not stopping them. They have it easier, yeah. though. They can rotate one or two suit, you know, two suit jackets, a few ties, a couple shirts, and nobody's going to really pay attention. There was that news anchor in Australia who famously did this after his female colleagues had criticism about what they looked like and what they wore on air. The most popular morning show in Australia, he wore the same suit every single day for an entire year. Guess what? Nobody noticed. No one even cared. (laughs) No one cared. No one emailed in. Nobody noticed at all. So what does that tell you? And that was the big thing. For me, it was the double standard. 
because our male colleagues yeah. almost never get emails like this. One of our anchors in 12 years, he's had three emails about one was about a tie he wore. One was someone didn't like his glasses. Only one was an actual personal attack. In that case, it was about his weight. But other so he's had one attacking his appearance. Yeah, I feel like this kind of opens a window too. like when I have had to do anything on camera and there's hot lights, I am because I'm not used to it. I will start sweating right away. It's very uncomfortable, let alone women who do that every day, let alone women who are at different stages in their life. This is what I've been thinking about over the last like few days um, watching, you know, your story kind of go viral. It's like, what about the women who have to go to work every day going through things like menopause, going through uncomfortable things that men just simply don't understand and don't have to deal with? Right. There, there was an anchor I worked with a few years ago who was going through menopause and she was always in, you know, short sleeve tops, even in the newsroom and our newsroom's freezing. So I'm always bundled up in a sweater in the newsroom and she was always in something sleeveless because she's like, oh, it's so hot. And that was how she managed it. So like, who are you to judge why someone might be sleeveless? It just seems wrong that a wardrobe yeah. choice is what you're talking about. That's what matters when there's so many. Yeah big issues in the world right now. And I did get a yeah. little flat because people are like, oh, you're crying because someone didn't like your dress. My feelings actually weren't hurt by this. I had a woman actually email in from Ottawa and the email was titled, boo hoo you, you're crying because someone didn't like your dress. You should get a thicker skin, which I've had hundreds of emails and they, that was the, there were two that weren't very nice and the rest were so supportive and amazing. And thank you for speaking out and thank you for drawing attention to what women face. But yeah, it was, course another woman sending this and that's I'm not upset about the email I'm sick and tired of this double <laughs> standard and the fact of what women in the yeah. public put up with I've had some high-ranking politicians in BC reach out to me after this to say oh thank you you know I've just tried to ignore it but I think that was wrong because and they would send me screenshots and some wording of some of the emails that they've had and messages they've had all about their appearance not about the job they're doing not about their politics but, oh, your hair looks terrible. And why were you wearing those boots? Nothing to do with their job. Even though, you know, the sad part of it is that we're like constantly having the same conversation. Thank you again for bringing it up. <laughs> so, um, I, I want to talk like your your career. The One of the things I love so much about this podcast is I find that um, it's connected me with women I would have never known from all different places. And um, I've spent a little bit of time in Victoria. Actually, I, I did some in-game hosting for the World Juniors in um, the 2019 year. Oh, awesome. Victoria is where you are now. Victoria is your home, but you, you know, you've got 20, more than 20 years experience. Um, what has been your career highlight on screen or off screen? Oh, okay. Oh, one of my career highlights was when I was in Winnipeg and I was sent up to Churchill, Manitoba to do a story on climate change. And it was just amazing. The government took us up in a plane and we got to see the polar bears and, you know, you're in Winnipeg one morning and then that later that day you're standing on the tundra and it was just amazing. So that was fantastic. I've gotten to interview some amazing people. Prince Philip was one uh, interview that was just so much fun. He had a crazy sense of humor and kept us laughing. Really? Uh, yes, which I would not have thought. I thought, oh, he's, you. if you look at him, you think, oh, he was so uptight. He was, you know, with the stiff upper lip, British, all of that. But he was cracking jokes and self-deprecating and funny. so funny. Yeah, that surprised me. Um, Gene Simmons was a fun interview. He started interviewing me for his reality show while I was trying to interview him. <laughs> You're like, dude, we got to we got to get through this. <laughs> I got to do something here. <laughs> so that was funny. Yeah, there's been, awesome. there's been lots of really neat experiences. I always tell people in TV journalism, and, and I'm out of reporting now. I just cover positive stories that happen now. So I'm out of the day-to-day -day news side of things. But in day-to-day -day news, you see the best and worst of society and the best and worst of human nature because you're at some horrible, horrible things, um, you know, murder scenes, car crashes, children being abused. Yeah. And then on the other side of that, you meet people doing incredible things in the world, people making a difference, people volunteering, people making the change they want to see. So it's amazing to see that side of it. And now all I focus on is the positive side, which is great because after years of 
covering the hard stuff, it takes a toll on you personally. I've uh, watched it firsthand My um, before moving into this uh, condo. Um, my roommate was a, a TV reporter for uh, <laughs> Global. So yeah, I saw it all. I heard it all at the dinner table. It was something different every night. Yeah. But um, so on that flip side of the harder journalism stuff that you've done over the years, what's like the hardest story that you found yourself covering? Oh, it was, and actually the reason that I don't want to report hard news anymore, um, two little girls here were murdered on Christmas Day, Aubrey and Chloe Berry. And it was just heartbreaking. Um, I actually went to junior high with their mom because I grew up in Victoria oh. and then moved away, came back. And I just, I have no words for it. Their father killed them to get back at their mother. Oh my goodness. Um, and it just was the most, it hit all of the first responders. It hit all of us covering it in the media, um, at their funeral. I was there to cover the funeral, which this huge outpouring of community support. I'm sobbing, listening to the eulogies and listening to, you know, the loss and the impact it had on their classmates, their family, everybody, the community. It just, um, was the the worst story I've ever covered. And I had to cover yeah. the court case. And of course, he didn't just plead guilty. He tried to argue someone had broken into the lock department and, and done this. And it, it just, and he's still launching appeals. So I'm not even going to say his name because it, okay. it, he doesn't deserve it. Um, but my yeah. heart goes out to their mom, who has been so inspiring. And uh, if I lost both my children, I don't know if I could recover. I don't know if I'd ever be able to move beyond that. Um, yeah. And she has just done it, an amazing job of, of showing grace and speaking out about domestic violence, which is still such a major issue that we don't talk about enough. You know, police until recently would be like, oh, it's a domestic and it's not. But no, it, a domestic is a very serious thing. It's one of the most serious things police can go to in terms of their own safety not to mention the carnage from domestic abuse and not talking about that. That's what we should be talking about, not my sleeves. We should be talking about domestic abuse and how do we finally stop this? And how do we stop putting women and children through this? And these extreme cases where the person ends up murdering their whole family, and that's actually the second case of that happening in Victoria in recent memory. Um, Peter Lee, years before, murdered his children and his wife, his in-laws. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking because how can someone who's supposed to love you the most do that to you? Yeah. And it's, I mean, not just the community of, in Victoria, but like, you know, murdered and missing Indigenous women. That's a another yeah. topic that we've been talking about a lot across the country um, over the the last few years, but it's been happening for way more than just a few years. It's just finally okay. people are um, getting more comfortable with talking and about it talking and making about- we should be talking about that more because that one in particular is something we haven't talked about. I anchored the news in Terrace and that Highway 16 corridor where so many Indigenous women have gone missing. It it, it just wasn't being taken seriously. So that would have been 1999. You know, that was happening when I was there and we didn't get a ton of news coverage. Uh, police didn't really do much about it where... Uh, If it was a white woman who went missing, the response was completely different. Different, yeah. So that is one of the pluses of being in the media is when you see these inequalities and see these things that aren't getting attention, you can try to bring attention to that and open that conversation and get people to care about something that they really should care about. You do a lot of volunteer work now. Um, I was reading up on your, your bio. Uh, what are the causes uh, over the years that have become the most important to you and why? Uh, two main ones. So um, I've coached skating for Special Olympics for years. I started doing that. Actually, when I was up in Terrace, I started coaching in Kitimat. I was young and alone up there. And I thought, okay, I'm going to get back. I'm going to find something to do. And and it just Special Olympics is just the most amazing organization. It's life-changing for people. And to see someone who thinks they can't do something and then you – help them and teach them and the growth and the friendship they get from all of that as well as amazing. So for people who don't know, Special Olympics helps people with developmental disabilities engage in sport, but it's really about the community it builds for them. It builds them a support network. It builds them friends. It 
gives them amazing opportunities. And now I run the public speaking program for Special Olympics in Victoria, and I've actually been sent to across the prairies and to the Yukon to do training for athletes to become public speakers because they're amazing ambassadors. And when they tell their stories, they'll make you laugh, they'll make you cry, the things they overcome. One of our main speakers here had had a stutter since she was a child. She was afraid to speak. And she's now our best speaker, telling her story, raising money, raising oh, awareness. Amazing. And it's just, it's so inspiring and amazing to see. So I love Special Olympics. And then the other cause really, since I was a child, close to my heart has been animals. I love animals. Um, and I host our pet show. Couldn't tell at all. <laughs> I know. Yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, there will be lots of videos of me hugging puppies and kittens and getting animals home. <laughs> so I've been involved with, with that as well, which is just heartwarming to see animals that have just come from awful situations from abuse. Uh, we had a dog on last week who was found frozen, almost frozen to death in the prairies. And now after a few months in foster care is doing great and will have a happy home. And it's just amazing to see on Pet Check, we've had hundreds of animals on and almost all of them have been adopted and a lot of senior dogs and a lot of animals with medical cases that might be harder to adopt out. So it's great to raise awareness about pet issues and responsible pet ownership. Is Pet Check a segment or is it a show? So it's, uh, I'd love it to be a show. It's a segment in our five o'clock news on Sunday. So it's about four, four minutes or so where we have different animals on for adoption. We partner with the Victoria Humane Society, which is the biggest rescue group here. Um, and they save animals from all across Western Canada. So we have them on. And then once a month, we have a different rescue on to raise awareness about the good work they're doing. And all of these rescues are their volunteer run. It's all volunteers saving all of these animals. So there's foster families who take the animals into their house and responsible pet ownership because pets are members of our family. Yeah, my parents actually just rescued um, a very sweet, oh my God, she's the sweetest dog. Um, she's half... Bernese Mountain Dog and Half Poodle. And oh. uh, yeah, she, she she was like days away from being discarded, which oh. makes us very sad because she's the best dog. So yes. I hear you on all of that. Um, so you mentioned before we started recording um, your kids, one is 16, one is 19, if I have that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, mom being in the media, you know, that's, I'm sure that's a topic of conversation that's come up a couple times at the dinner table or, or whatever. Um, not just this sleeve story, but talk to me about like how you've sort of spoken to your kids about what you do for a living and how, you know, some people can't keep their comments to themselves about all sorts of topics. Right. It's really been their whole life for them. When I started at Czech, my youngest son was two and my older son was five. And um, working weekends, I'd bring them to work a lot. And so for them, it's just normal that I'm on TV. Um, they they don't think it's anything special. They don't aren't surprised. They're surprised when we go out in public and especially when they were younger and we go grocery shopping and I get stopped every few feet and people would chat and they're like, oh my God, would people stop talking to you? So they didn't quite understand why it was happening. Um, but I haven't really talked to them about a lot of the emails. Um, it That hasn't mean something that came up with this one. And there was a previous one I tweeted about. Someone had complained about my snow boots because I was, it was a woman. Oh, who, come on. Oh, yes. I was, uh, it was over Christmas and we were doing weather outside. It was a couple years ago, first year of COVID. And you, you, when you're outside live on location during the week, we have five o'clock and six o'clock weather. So it's a two hour block. You're on the air and then you have to be there beforehand. So you're basically outside for three hours and it gets cold. There was no snow, but you're going to get cold being outside. So I always like to have my feet warm. So I have these cozy little snow boots. They're like Sorel type snow boots. They're not yeah. inappropriate in any way. Um, and they're not much to look at. But this lady said, whoa, are you trying to be young? Are you trying to pretend you're a teenager? I didn't know snow boots had an age limit. That was why well, I talked to them about that one. And they just thought it was silly. With this one, they have joked that they're the only ones who get to criticize my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> See, and you're like, yes, you can yeah. tell me if you yeah, don't like, like it. You I live in my house. Them. I want them. Yes, inside my house. Tell me if I look terrible before I walk out the door, please. So they have no problem doing that. They're very good at um, giving me lots of unsolicited feedback. <laughs> but, they, I think they were surprised about how this blew up. 
Um, cause they're like, why is it a thing? Why is this, why does it matter if you're wearing sleeves? And as a strong yeah. independent woman, I've tried to raise boys to respect women and, and I've tried to talk to them about what women go through that they wouldn't even as white teenage boys, their experience is going to be very different than what a woman or a person of color would go through. So I've tried to impart that to them that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what it's like to walk in this world as a woman or a teenage girl. And, you know, you don't know what kind of things you face because there's so much you just take for granted and just it is and nobody bothers you. Nobody tells you you shouldn't wear that. So I have tried to talk to them about it a little bit. And they're, I think at this point, they've had enough of the uh, discussion because we've had so many emails and so many comments. And now wherever I go, people are saying, way to go, bear arms. Yes, wear bear, bear arms all the time. <laughs> So uh, I saw that hashtag. I was laughing. <laughs> the right yeah, to bear arms. The right to bear arms. I never thought I would be arguing about the right to bear arms, but yeah. But here we uh, are. It's 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 been quite an experience, and it's crazy. It's had seven hundred and fifty plus thousand views, which is just shocking to me that 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 would be the case. But I think it just hit a nerve with people. And in twenty twenty three, we're better than this. We should be better than this. We need to stop attacking women for how they look. It doesn't matter if it's a woman or not, uh, but is there someone that you can think of that has said something that has always stuck with you, maybe as a mentor over the years? Oh, oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think the best advice I ever had was just to be me, uh, especially starting out when you're a young woman and you're more self-conscious and you're like, oh, and you're... I was very young when I started in TV. I was anchoring the news in my early 20s. Um, so you want to look credible and you want people to be able to trust you. So in those early years, you're trying to, oh, I'm wearing a blazer and I'm credible and I'm you know, trying to lower my voice and sound like I should have authority. Um, so being told just be myself was the best advice because when you're trying to be something you're not, it's it's disingenuous and it comes through. And if you're yourself, I think that's what our viewers have responded to, especially with the pet segment. I'm it's like, I'm talking to my own pets. You know, I use silly voices sometimes. <laughs> I'm cuddling them. They're looking at my face. I have the, the, my silliness comes out with that and, and, and doing whether I can just be myself because it's not a serious story where I have to um, put on a serious face. So I think that's the best advice just to, to be yourself and let that shine through. Uh, the worst advice, which has really oh, do me, tell that I've ever had was in Ottawa. When I was still in Ottawa starting out, I was told I could be pretty or smart, but not both. So I needed to pick one. Who said that? A man or a woman? A man said that to me. Yes. Oh, my God. So when I've retold that story, my kids like to joke. So which one did you pick, mom? They can't tell which one I picked, but. Yeah. Well, is that person still employed in the industry? I don't know. Yeah, that was not someone I decided to keep in touch with. So I'm Fair. not sure. But that that was so that's going back to the late 90s, not that long ago, right? It it should be why do I have to pick? Do men have to pick being smart or handsome? Bald? <laughs> yeah, they have to pick between oh, I can be good looking and that I'm the eye candy or I can be smart. You'll take me seriously. Somehow they thought that I couldn't be, can't be both as a woman. You had to pick one. So uh, that's yeah. actually worked in my favor for my career though, because people will underestimate you thinking, Oh, she's just a pretty face or she's just a dumb blonde. Um, so I've, there's been lots of interviews where just like sweetly going, Oh, but wait, didn't you just say, and then you catch them. You in the interviewed water. three of the four, last four prime ministers. Yeah. Like, yeah. come on. Stephen Harper was the exception. And that's because he almost, he declined almost every interview and was very controlled on, there'd be a press opportunity. Two people could ask a question. He'd approve who got to ask it in advance. You'd have to provide the question in writing, which is really not uh, free speech and covering things fairly. But yes, so uh, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, and Justin Trudeau, I had the chance to interview. That's very cool. Any, tell me about something that stood out about your, your conversation with Justin Trudeau. I think what stood out, so how everyone was like, oh, he's dreamy. I'm like, what? I don't think he's dreamy. 
But when I w- interviewed him, he made locked in on eye contact and it really surprised me. And I could see if you meet him in person, how, how he can have that effect on people because he just looked at you. There were all these other reporters and tons of other media there, but he just locked in, answered my question, actually answered it, which a lot of politicians don't do. They will give you the answer they've <laughs> prepared to say to any question yes. that's asked. This is what the message we're trying to send out. So we, I can say it's the sky blue and they'll answer with, yes, we are looking into this issue and, or yes, we're really working hard to make this happen. And they're not answering the question. So we actually answered the question, which surprised me. And then he just locked in and I had a follow up as well. And it was just a very sort of intense. Politicians aren't usually like that. So that Mm -hmm. surprised me with him. Yeah, Um, it's almost like his focus was striking. Yes, it was very. So that really surprised me. Um, Paul Martin was is so smart. And um, yeah, he had sort of a or definitely a rough ride as prime minister, but he was, I, when I started out in Ottawa on Parliament Hill, he was finance minister and he was one of the best finance ministers we've ever had. So, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I liked like, when you interviewed him, you actually felt like you liked him, which was, yeah, yeah. You know, with some people you just feel like, Oh, okay. I think, yeah. You seem like a, a decent person. I often wonder if I stayed in Ottawa, I actually dropped out of Carleton. Um, I often wonder how my life would look now if I if I stayed in the program. I was getting pretty good marks, but I was just like so upset that I couldn't like be out on the street doing streeters like my friends were at Ryerson at that time. And I got like, I think I got bored of the program in the first year. I don't know. Right. Yeah. There's so many paths. Even with jobs, that's been the case. Well, what if I take in that first job instead of Sault Ste. Marie? What if I take in a job that was in Oshawa? Right. And what if I... You kind of wonder yeah. where, you, where your path would have gone. But I, I do think you're meant to go a certain way and it's almost never a straight line. Uh, and every experience you yeah. learn something from. I When I interview people for, I write um, for some magazines and do a business column and I always ask entrepreneurs and successful people, what's the biggest mistake you've made or when you've learned the most from? Because I think we learn more from our mistakes than our successes. So I think all those experiences and the choices you've made all have gotten you to where you are today and made you the person you are today. Yeah. What's the biggest lesson you've learned? I mean, you put the question in my mind. 100%. As I was saying that, New York. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The biggest lesson I've learned. I think the biggest lesson is to walk in the world in a positive way and to put out the energy that you want to get back. I think when you mm-hmm. go through life, even you're just out running errands and you're frowning and that's the energy you get back. If you go through life positive, looking at, okay, what can I take from this? Glass half full. Yeah, this was terrible. And I've been through some terrible things. This bare arm thing is not a terrible thing at all, right? This the right, right. viewers are, are not a terrible thing. So I think if you learn from the hard parts of life and then appreciate the good parts. And that's one thing working in news has taught me tomorrow is not guaranteed. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. So you have to live each day like it matters and make the most of each day, hug your kids every day, tell them you love them because you don't know what could happen. There could be a car accident. There could be some awful tragedy around the corner and you don't know. So I think not sweating the small stuff, letting the little things go, focusing on, big picture, what actually matters, which I would hope that's what COVID has taught us, that family, friends, connections, that's what really matters, our health. Those are the things in life that really matter. That COVID would have made us better. It seems like people are angrier and more critical. I know it's been a rough go. It's been a hard slog for a lot of people. Um, But that is really what the takeaway for me was. And, and, early on in COVID when we were all stuck at home all the time, it was such a gift to have that time with my teenagers and to have more family time. Yeah. And I imagine really with the out. career that you chose, you never spent that much time with them. Well, they spent a lot of time at the station. <laughs> I've made career decisions. I'm back here in Victoria because of family. Um, I had wanted to anchor the Today Show and, you know, go to New York and I had all these big dreams. But once I had children, 
your priorities change. So I have made that my focus. And uh, when my kids were younger, we'd make a, a summer fun list every year, 50 things we want to do this summer. And then that became 100 things. And then it became an all year fun list that our New Year's resolution would be here are all the things, the fun things we want to do this year. Because I, it was after two friends of mine in their 30s died of cancer. And they both had children around the same age as my children. And it's that reminder that life is fleeting and you have to make the most of it. So we started our fun times and we've had so many adventures. My older son's been to 37 countries. We've just done as much as we can to maximize life and, and have some really great memories. And that's what they remember. It's the experiences. It's not how big it, our TV is or if they got a new iPhone. It's the stuff yeah. you do and the experiences you have and the people you meet. Yeah, for sure. So last thing that I sort of wanted to touch on about your career, um, I find it really interesting right now that you're in the weather anchored position and climate change is arguably the biggest topic right now. And mm -hmm. every single person plays a role in the world that we're going to leave for others tomorrow. Did you think that weather was going to maybe be a different role than it's become? So I think weather is more important than ever uh, now with climate change. And we're seeing so much more extreme weather. Uh, 2021 was yeah. our most extreme year ever on Vancouver Island for weather. So we had just drought for eight and a half months. It was our driest spring. And then we had the heat dome in the summer, that deadly heat dome that we saw in, the oh, Pacific yeah, yeah. And in BC. So it was our hottest summer ever. Um, we had three massive heat waves. And normally in the Pacific, here on the West Coast, the Pacific's our natural air conditioner, right? So we're much more temperate. We don't, it doesn't get really cold and it doesn't get really hot. So summer's usually in the twenties. So to have 40 degree temperatures and above was absolutely crazy. And we're not equipped for that here. Most people don't have air conditioning. We don't have the kind of things in place for climates that get hotter summers. So it was crazy. And then in BC, we had the hottest temperature in the world, which was just crazy to see as well. And then after that, we then had our wettest fall where we had basically monsoon rains, highways wiped out all across the province. That's how much rain we got. It was just crazy. So it's one extreme to the other. Last year was very similar where we had a super hot summer and more heat waves. It seems like there's constant, we're constantly breaking records. It's either we're way above seasonal or way below, below seasonal. We had this crazy snow at Christmas, just before Christmas here on the West Coast, which was our fourth snowiest snowfall on record. And that was coming off our a dry, dry fall where in October we were 25 Celsius in October. So it's just so extreme. And I'm a, I'm a bit of a science geek and like the data. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Like, you know, like to look at all of the numbers and see it to show, because we still get people saying climate change is not a thing. Well, if it's so hot, how could that be global warming? Well, OK, that's your, that's not what it is. It's climate change. And we are seeing more extreme on both sides. So we're going to get hotter summers here on the West Coast. We're going to get more extreme storms in winter. So wind, rain, snow, we're going to see those opposite dynamics and weather and damaging. It's very damaging weather, which is why we should all be concerned about it. And it doesn't seem like we're doing much to try to ease off the gas pedal in the direction we're going, right? It's only going to get yeah. worse. And it's not just here. We're seeing it all over the world where temperature records have been set in Europe for heat, this crazy fall, hot, hot weather they've had, extreme lows, the flooding, all of the really destructive weather events that we're seeing on the rise in the world because of climate change. So weather is definitely more important than it's ever been. It's to sort of be the throwaway, okay, what's the weather? But it really matters and we need to pay more attention. Yeah. To yeah. I couldn't have said that better myself. Well, thank you so much. I usually end um, the podcast by asking you to nominate a few women that you think would have great stories to share here on this podcast. Um, so give me a few names that come to mind. Sure. Two inspiring colleagues, actually, um, Jody Vance who, and Lisa, uh, Linda Steele. So they host our Vance and Steele show on Check, which started last year. Um, Jody broke down so many barriers in the sports world um, as an anchor and reporter. So 
I think she would be great because she certainly has some stories about how she overcame all of that and really made a name for herself in a man's world because sports journalism really still is a man's world. Um, and Linda Steele, she's a longtime anchor at CTV in Edmonton. Um, anyone in that part of the country will definitely know her name now. And she's been out here for a few years as well and is quite well known. And again, just breaking down those barriers. She's been in TV for so long and I'm sure it has stories similar to the stories I've had. But early on in her career, I'm sure it was even harder than when I started out and was told I could be pretty or smart. Um, and then another person I love in media here in BC is Carrie Adams. She's an anchor at CTV Vancouver. Um, and, and I'm sure she's been through similar things and had to overcome a lot. Um, she's made a big name for herself. She was also in Alberta. So she's pretty well known there as well as here in BC. And she's just a nice person. Yeah, the, the guest list for this podcast is ever growing. <laughs> and um, I love connecting with other women in this field where they're located. They might have such a different experience. There's so many things and so many parallels that you're just like, nope, we've gone through the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. Right? And actually, my partner didn't really get the the response to the tweet either, like how crazy it was. Um, and it wasn't until he's like, well, is it really, does it really matter? And it wasn't until female politicians started messaging me. And then I was reading him the messages they've got that he's like, oh, I get it now. Right, right. So love, love you, him. honey. But this is the thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he's like, or don't you like, you sure you should be talking about this so much? And, and like, no, 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 you don't understand. And then because he hasn't lived this experience. And then once he saw and I read to him some of those messages, he was like, wow, OK, I get it. Now I get it. And that was about three or four days in. And so. you know what? I think you brought up an interesting point and, a, and an, an important point that, of course, the sleeves are not what you're concerned about here. No. It's the double standard. And hopefully we've profiled your career a little bit for people to understand why you are smart and pretty and have accomplished all that you've accomplished. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you for lifting women up. That's what you do with your podcast, right? You lift women up and you share our stories and you help connect us. So thank you for doing that. Well, thank you for coming on. What happens when we play outside? We become healthier, both mentally and physically. We become more creative and more focused. We connect with nature, each other, and ourselves. Let's take this outside. A new podcast hosted by me, Marianne Iveson, an aspiring outdoor athlete and nature lover. I speak to athletes, outdoor professionals, and scientists about their connection to nature, how it affects their performance and everyday life. Let's take this outside. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, and at Let's Take This Outside. Ca. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.